Okay, you ready for your safety uh, video? Are you hydrated? You gotta remember self-care before we take care of others, we have to take care of ourselves. So if you need to get a glass of water, if you need to take a quick walk around the block, do a quick stretch or a meditation, whatever it is, remember that we take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. So make sure you're doing that. I'm doing that with um, my massive jug of water tonight. Okay, we're getting into the concept of safety. Now this is gonna be one video to cover both books. So you'll wanna have both the Gidden text and your Davis text ready to go. Giddens, we're gonna be doing chapter 45 and we'll do that one first and then we'll get into Davis. So um, there are a lot of medical errors that happen because of safety issues. And so uh, it cannot be understated the importance of safety as we talk about nursing practice and how safety is an underlying concept to whatever we do, because no matter what case, whatever situation we are in, we need to recognize the safety risks and know how to um, mitigate them as nurses. And if you're not convinced of that, I'm gonna show you a quick minute video um, that may convince you that medical errors and safety in healthcare needs to be a top priority. In an important study tonight, it has been reported that medical errors are now the third largest cause of death behind heart disease and cancer. Dr. John LaPook has been looking into this. Dr. Martin McCary of Johns Hopkins School of Medicine co-authored today's analysis on medical errors. We're talking about patients dying from the care that they receive rather than the disease or injury for which they seek care. We're talking about things that happen that shouldn't happen in a sound health care system. Medical errors include mistakes in diagnosis, inadequate discharge instructions, and preventable complications such as infections picked up in the hospital. Patients don't just die from heart plaques and bacteria, they can also die from communication breakdowns and medication errors. System level problems are almost ubiquitous in healthcare. Johns Hopkins Armstrong Institute touted patient safety in this video. It initiated a quality control program that reduced bloodstream infections from catheters by 40%. So John, what is a patient supposed to do to defend himself? Well, patients can only do so much. You can ask questions. What are the risks? What are the benefits? I like to tell my patients if they're in the hospital, try to have a family member or a friend in the room if possible. But ultimately, this is the responsibility of hospitals and medical centers to shine a light on the problem. And for a long time, that light has simply been too dim. But I have to say, in recent years, there's been a huge effort to look at this more closely, to turn it into a science and say, what are the systemic problems? It may be several things working in concert. Identify them and fix the problem. When in doubt, ask lots of questions. Dr. John LaPook, doctor, thank you. So as healthcare workers, we have a responsibility to provide safety, to decide where the safety risks are, to recognize system-wide safety issues, um, and then to take personal responsibility to doing things the right way and following the protocols and standards that we learn. So as we get into talking about safety, we're going to describe the and define the concept. We're going to identify safety in both nursing and healthcare practice, and then we'll talk about some exemplars and how this is most commonly played out in nursing. So go ahead and we're going to be working through our Giddens check text first. So please have that in front of you so you can be highlighting and taking notes. And don't forget to have your concept study guide worksheet available as well so you can fill that out as you go. That's going to highlight the most important things that you need to take away from any concept. So the definition of safety is freedom from accidental injuries. Ensuring patient safety involves establishment of operational systems and processes. Remember that big picture um, uh, to minimize the likelihood of error and let maximize the likelihood of intercepting them where they occur. Figuring out where our pressure points are for having safety risks and addressing them at a system level. Safe care means avoiding injuries. So remember, patients come to us to get better, not to get worse. And so we don't want to cause more harm than we do good. And then patient safety is about the prevention of healthcare errors and making sure that we um, mitigate patient injuries caused by healthcare errors. So there's different kinds of errors that can occur in a healthcare setting. The adverse events are unintended harm by an act of commission or omission, meaning you did something or you failed to do something, rather than as a disease process. So in other words, 
whatever is going on with the patient isn't because of the illness they're having. It's because we either did something to them or didn't do something that we should have. A near miss is something that could have caused harm to a patient, but somehow someone caught it before, it act the, before the safety risk actually met, met the patient. So we, we barely missed it, glad we found that, but we still need to recognize that. So hopefully those near misses don't happen in the future and become adverse effects and events with other patients. And then sentinel events are those ones that you just never ever should happen in healthcare, like the death of a patient um, or serious injury because of something a, a, a hospital worker either did or didn't do that they should have. So safety is a, a, a concept that we are constantly considering in nursing and we are always on a continuum of safety. So we are on a continuing from keeping patients safe to these whew, near misses to hopefully never experiencing the patient, a patient injury or death due to an error. So we're always on this continuum and we just want to be on the good side of keeping patients safe um, as, we, as we practice. So there's different kinds of, in, of errors that can happen, different categories. So we can miss a diagnosis, we could, not, we could miss a problem or misidentify a problem with a patient. It can be an error in treatment, either we didn't do something or we should have done something. We could have failed to prevent something. So a patient who has breast cancer and for somehow we, we missed that um, or the radiologist missed that on the ultrasound. Um, or a, a, a communication error. Boy, have you ever played telephone as a child? You know that game where you pass a message on and by the time it gets back to you, it's a completely different message. So there's a, definitely a chance for human error in communication. And think about how many times um, communication has to be handed off about a patient during a hospital visit. Every six, every eight to 12 hours, you've got a new nurse coming in, you've got different residents overnight taking care of patients, different rapid response teams. And at all these, we're just, we're just playing a giant game of telephone, aren't we? And so we have to really make sure that we're not having errors in communication. Um, I'll tell you, as a new nurse, I was still learning all the ER medications that we give most commonly, and a guy came in with chest pain, and there was a fourth year Cook County resident, and he said, go ahead and give three sublingual nitros um, for this patient, and I was like, all at once or five minutes apart? Okay, well, you would never give three sublingual nitros all at once. It's going to bottom out their blood pressure, and they're not going to have a blood pressure, and that's triple the dose that you'd want to give at once. But, you know, he was just very flippantly gave, saying, go ahead and give three nitros as if I should know what that meant. And so it was a communication breakdown. And I'm glad that I clarified that instead of assumed that I knew what I was talking about. And so it could have led to an error had I not clarified that with the doctor. And then there's these different kinds of placement of errors. So it can be blunt end or sharp end. In other words, these organizational or system-wide errors that the system is set up to fail people, or it can be the sharp end where it's these active errors, this direct care of patient involvement. Um, for example, a medication administration system, an Omnicel or a Pixis, has set up and it has um, look-alike, sound-alike drugs right next to each other to be able to be pulled out. It would be really easy for people to pull the wrong one, right? And that's a system issue because it's set up for everyone to use that way. That would be a blunt end error. Uh, on the flip side, a, a, a nurse who just gives the wrong medication and or gives a medication IM instead of IV, it gives the wrong route. That would be a sharp end individual at the bedside giving a wrong, uh, making an error for a patient. So categories of errors can be types of errors or the placement of where those errors occurred. So in the past, uh, there was a pretty poor culture of safety and accountability in hospitals in that um, there was this idea of, well, whose fault is it? We gotta go after that person and figure out whose fault it was and, and fix it. And we've shifted as a culture from who to blame to what went wrong. Because oftentimes it's not about the individual. It's about system errors and system setups that, are, that could happen to another person. And so we, we're trying to shift blame from individuals to identifying the root cause of the problem and then fixing that root cause going forward. 
So safety is not only a priority concept in nursing as a profession, but also in nursing school. And that is demonstrated by the competencies um, and values of QSIN. Now, this is getting a little peek behind the curtain of the philosophies and, and priorities of your nursing education. And so QSIN is an organization, a not-for-profit, that stands for Quality and Safety Education for Nurses. So it's making sure that we as nurse educators are making sure that we elevate certain competencies and priorities for you to know and understand before you graduate. And those six competencies are listed here, patient-centered care, teamwork and collaboration, evidence-based practice, quality improvement, safety, and informatics, which means the tech side of healthcare. And so you'll see that safety is not only a priority in healthcare, but it's one of the six highest things we value in terms of competencies that we need to train you on in the next two years. So this is not a one and done kind of safety education. You will be talking about safety as it relates to basically everything we do in the next two years. So what does CUSIN say about the concept of safety? Um, all of the concepts in QSIN focus on three attributes, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And so for knowledge, the focus of safety is on the execution of skills, as well as on the tech, and, then, and of course at the system level, the organization level. And then for skills, nurses need to be able to use the tools they have available to make safer systems, and also be able to know what you're doing with those tools. And that's what we're kind of teaching you in lab. And then of course, attitudes. So you need to have value in your role, in the role of safety and the, the part that you play in that. And most often we are kind of the last, um, last line of defense between an error and the patient because we are the one who, again, the coordinator of care, we kind of see the big picture of what's going on. We know these patients very um, intimately because we're with them for eight to 12 hours on a shift. And so we need to own that, um, that role of safety in, in how we care for patients. In your Blackboard, there is a link, an optional link for you to be able to click right to the QSIN website. And I would encourage you to just pop over there and take a look at these priorities um, if you get a minute. Go ahead on 30, 432, you can just skip right over those theoretical links. Isn't it nice when you don't have to read all the chapter? <laughs> And then on 432, we talk about just culture. And again, that goes into the idea of a healthcare system's value in of reporting errors without punishment. The last hospital I worked at, um, every time you would report an error or even a near miss, something that didn't happen to a patient, but boy, we caught it really in the nick of time, um, you had to file something called an incident report. And incident reports did not get re um, reported outside of the organization. It was just for within the organization for the risk management department to look at some issues that we had in the hospital and identify ways to improve. And every time you filled out an incident report online and it, was, it went to risk management, if you had put your name on it, then your name went into a hat. And at the end of each week, they raffled off like a $50 Amazon gift card. And it was just a way to let the hospital employees know that we value your feedback. We want to know when there are these adverse events or near misses so that we can, as a, as a hospital, can get better. So it's this balance of um, needing to learn from mistakes and the need for disciplinary action against an individual. I've sat on a couple committees in the past where it was really interesting. We would look at cases um, at the hospital that didn't go as planned and had poor patient outcomes. And then we would look at all the documentation, talk to all the people involved and try to determine, so is this an individual problem? Did this one nurse really just mess up and not follow the rules? Or is there some kind of system thing that we need to fix? So it's not about punishing that one nurse, but how can we make this better for the hospital? Super interesting to be on that kind of committee and it definitely makes you even more hyper aware of your own practice when you're seeing things that aren't going right in, in nursing. So transparency in healthcare is very important. Um, there are required things that hospitals have to report these days things on uh, for CMS, the, for Medicare, and also for things like hospitalgrade.org. And so it's an easy way for consumers, because we're all consumers as patients, to go on and see how their healthcare is and how that hospital stacks up to other ones in their community. And um, they have to report information on things like safety and evidence-based practice and patient satisfaction scores. And so it requires transparency with open communication with patients. 
Um, and disclosure is, is, and transparency in healthcare is one way as a healthcare system in the country, we, we improve care for the patients because we're always sort of competing against each other essentially um, on making sure that we have the best outcomes and the best things for the patients. Okay, interrelated concepts. We love this idea, everything, remember we're interlocks. And so safety goes with a lot of different concepts. And if certainly there's this overlap with quality because if we're having safe patient care, then our outcomes are gonna be a high quality, what we are expecting patients' outcomes to be. And there are things that interplay with safety and depend on safety and safety, de and, um, safety of care depends on them. And so things like care coordination, making sure that you're coordinating care appropriately and getting the right people involved and that those people are communicating effectively within that so that we don't have that breakdown of communication like a bad telephone game. And then if certainly there's collaboration because we work as part of a much larger healthcare system and we're working with all sorts of interprofessionals and making sure that we are um, engaging with the right professionals at the right time, giving them the right information and for them to give us the right information to create a safe environment and provide safe patient care. A couple of exemplars are listed in your Giddens text. We're going to go into them more deeply as we look at Toward Davis. So go ahead and just read through this page on 433 to get familiar with the stuff that they're talking about there, and then we're going to move on to Davis. Before we move on to Davis, go ahead and take a look at that case study about Gloria and 434. We're going to talk about that in class, and the purpose of our class time is to really get into the more analysis and synthesis of learning so that we can really engage with these concepts more deeply and have you really integrate and understand them fully. And so we don't want to waste a whole bunch of time just reading the stuff in class. So if you can just read through, it's like two or three paragraphs about Gloria, just so you have a, the gist of it, and then we will be analyzing together in class. For now, let's go ahead and switch over to our Davis chapter 24. And we're just gonna to touch on a few high points from this chapter to just get a couple examples of how safety is most often at play in healthcare and what we can do about it. So we're looking at page 542 and around there in your text where we're gonna talk about safety hazards in the healthcare facility. And these are things that um, can impact how we how we provide care to patients. Now we know fall prevention is a huge um, necess necess necessary um, thing for nurses to be involved in. And what some of the ways we can prevent falls in the hospital include doing fall risk assessments. Um, we're making sure that these, the environment is safe so that we, have, we don't have slippery floors, um, that, we, that the patients have any assistive devices that they use for walking right with them, that they have call lights with them so that they're not trying to get up to the bathroom by themselves if they're unstable and making sure that we're educating our patients about their risks for falls and what to do about that. Falls are one of those things where, you know, a patient comes in for one thing and then they end up with a whole nother can of worms because of, a, because of something like a fall that can happen in healthcare. And so we wanna make sure that we are not causing more harm than good. Alarm fatigue is certainly a risk in healthcare You'll notice as you go into clinicals, or maybe you already work in a healthcare setting, that there are just a lot of buzzers and alarms and bells that go on. And after a while, our brains start to kind of tune that out. Now, anyone who has children and has been on a road trip will be able to relate to that just from life because, you know, how many times can we listen to, well, my, my, my oldest child is a little bit older now, but when they were little, they were big fans of Dora the Explorer, and we would listen to Dora the Explorer on road trips just ad nauseum. I mean, we had them memorized. We could sing them in our sleep. And boy, they get really annoying. But after a while, your brain just starts tuning it out. And unfortunately, it's the same thing with alarms in the healthcare system. And those alarms mean something. And so it can be very dangerous to tune those out. Of course, there can be equipment-related accidents, fires, um, and then a huge area of safety is restraints. Patients in restraints can uh, so we've now restricted their liberties, their freedoms, and their ability to move. And they can have suffocation injuries. Um, they can have joint dislocations. 
there are, they can have skin breakdown, they can aspirate and choke. There are so many things that can happen when a patient is in restraints. We're not gonna get into that in great detail right now, but just know that restraints are a huge source of litigation in healthcare and a huge safety hazard. There are certain rules and regulations about say about restraints. You have to have proper documentation saying that the patient needed it and there was nothing else that we you tried other um, other things to do besides put them in restraints and nothing else work and that you have a doctor's note saying that, an order saying that this is what is um, needed and you have to have specific and very strict documentation for restraints. So there's a whole lot of, lot of safety things put in place, but we have to heed them and, and carefully assess for those patients to prevent from any injuries from restraints. And of course, you know, as healthcare workers, we assume some level of risk in what we do. Um, and there are things put in place to keep us as safe as possible as well. So back injuries in healthcare workers are not uncommon, but a lot of places have very high tech lift equipment and education these days to prevent some of that. Needle stick injuries are also not uncommon, um, but there are a lot of safety devices available in the type of equipment we use to prevent that. Radiation injuries can happen from things like x-ray. And so people who are around radiation a lot in the hospital will wear little radiation buttons to monitor their level. And then unfortunately, violence in healthcare is, is a real health care worker hazard, especially if you're working in places like an emergency room or an ICU where patients are quite ill and tensions can be high. Uh, there was one time when a patient, we had this little little girl, she was like four years old and she coded, she came in coding. We um, tried to resuscitate her for over an hour and did CPR and medications and everything we could do. And at the end of that, uh, we had to call it. And um, I accompanied the doctor and the chaplain in to talk to the family and to tell them that their little girl had just died. And the dad was in the family waiting room and he absolutely just destroyed the room. We had lamps and chairs and the walls had holes in them and everything was shattered. And he was just so devastated and rightfully so. But there are risks in what we do when we care for our mental health patients, when we care for patients on PCP or an alcohol overdose, like there are risks to what we do. And so there's lots of training that goes into that too in terms of de-escalation and crisis prevention and how to protect yourself for that. So there's risks, but there's also um, things to mitigate those risks. And as you read about these things more thoroughly in your Davis text, you'll be reading about that as well. Finally, the Joint Commission, which is one of the accrediting, accrediting bodies that makes sure that hospitals are practicing safely, um, has provided national patient safety goals. And the, with, the, with the goal to improve patient safety. So the Joint Commission has a great bird's eye view of what's going on in hospitals because they go and do accreditation visits at hospitals every few years. And so they can kind of see what are the key things that hospitals struggle with. So what can we elevate as patient safety goals? And so these are the goals that are identified for 2020, making sure that we're identifying the right patient making sure we've got good staff communication, that medications are used safely, that we're using alarms safely and that we're responding to them and not getting that alarm fatigue, that we're preventing hospital acquired infections, that we um, identify patient safety risks and do something about it. So if we can identify it early and, and prevent, re prevent those um, injuries, that's, that's what we wanna accomplish, and then prevent mistakes in surgery. So those are those national safety goals that we want to align with and consider. And remember, Joint Commission has this bird's eye view of what's going on in all the hospitals. And so they're saying these are the things that are most important right now that we're missing on in hospitals. That's it for your safety lecture. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I'm so grateful for you. Um, and I'll see you in class. Have a great night.